So our, our next and, and final speaker of this evening is, um, well, final, no, not the second last speaker of the evening, is Damien Barrett from our One Health scientific support team here in the Department of Agriculture. Um, Damien qualified in UCD in, from the Veterinary College in 1996. And after spending four years in large animal practice, he returned to the Vet College to the Department of Large Animal Clinical Studies and before joining DAFM in 2003. He had a broad range of experience uh, during his time here in DAFM, having worked as the training officer. He's also worked in Severa and as a re research officer in Sligo Regional Veterinary Laboratory. Um, more recently, he's been working as a superintending veterinary inspector with responsibility for TSEs and also animal health surveillance. He also manages the One Health scientific support team since it was established last year in January 2020. He has a number of postgraduate qualifications and most recently completed his PhD in, on Schmallenberg virus last year. Um, Damien's going to speak to us uh, this evening on low pathogenic avian influenza outbreak that occurred uh, in spring 2020 in the Monaghan area. Whilst low pathogenic avian influenza is not all, it's not notifiable, it's epidemiolog epidemiology and the way it spreads is similar to high path AI. So the field of epidemiology, this field of epidemiology study will provide us with a few interesting lessons and how it is, how easy it is for pathogens to spread from premises to premises. So, so, I'll, so I'll hand over to you, Damien, if that's okay. Okay, thanks, June. Uh, now, as, and we can I'm see in here. Uh, yeah, uh, we're afraid I'm suffering from the same, the same uh, affliction that, uh, Mar oh, here we are. Um, the just background to this outbreak, there was, this was an LPI outbreak which was confirmed in 14 commercial uh, poultry flocks in County Monaghan um, between the 24th of February 2020 and the, uh, the, the, the 17th of June. Um, other than a severe drop in egg production in the case of, of, of laying flocks, there, there was um, the, 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 the clinical signs were, 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 were very mild. All flocks were treated as high path outbreaks until such time as they con were, were confirmed as low path. And the aim of, of, this, of this short um, presentation is to examine the epidemiology of the outbreak. Um, as I said, the, the, first, the first outbreak occurred in the week beginning the 24th of February. And it, it was just about, um, for most weeks, there was just uh, one case and not in, and just this timeline just shows you, but it peaked there in in the middle of um, in the middle of April. And in terms of location, eleven flocks were in the North Monaghan area, one west, one close to Monaghan town, and one in in the northwest. Uh, in terms of the production types, um, there were three turkey farms, which you'll find out was was significant later on. Seven free range flocks and seven, seven free range laying flocks and four confined laying flocks. And uh, we, in, in conjunction with our colleagues in, in the regional veterinary office, an audit of the, uh, the biosecurity practices were carried out in, 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 in the flocks affected. And the main findings of this were shared labor between a number of flocks, a lack of birds and rodent proofing, a buildup of debris and water which could attract wild birds, and there were con concerns over disinfection protocols for the interior of truck cabs, the cleansing and disinfection of wheel arches and the underbodies of trucks, and the separation of vehicles from poultry houses during the, during cleansing and disinfection. So, um, there there were a number of areas. Like one feature of this this is that there's a I, I won't give the game away too much, but there's a whole lot of um, Fingers being pointed to very by by various biosecurity issues, but there is no there or there really wasn't a single smoking gun detected. So we looked at a at a variety of potential introduction routes ranging from staff and family help, egg handling, veterinary practitioners, feed supply and feed hauliers, both the feed and the hauliers, water supply, pest control, dead bird movements, manure movements, and and depopulation teams. I won't go into de the, the detail on on that this evening because ju just in because of the short time we have. But um, each each of those work each of those were considered, and um, we'll we'll 
talk talk about the main findings later on. But one of the one one of the key elements in this was the was the genomic sequencing and um, the genomic sequencing of the 14 outbreaks was was performed in the reference laboratory and in Italy and um, these these 14 these 14 outbreaks in in the Monaghan flocks were were considered essentially the same virus because they seemed to be very closely related. There were, there were um, or we consider small mutations, but it, it, generally speaking, it, it all looked like it was it was the one virus that that was that was um, that, vi that, that that came into each herd or each flock rather. Um, in conjunction, um, there was a, a genomic sequencing of of the carried out comparing the um, the outbreak. In the closest outbreak in Northern Ireland with the index case, and again there was uh, the, 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 the genomic sequencing suggested very close correlation between the viruses. So this was really suggestive of single entry of virus into the island, uh, onto the island, rather than multiple incursions from wild birds. So this was suggesting. Um, uh, this was pointing more towards biosecurity rather than multiple incursions from from wildlife. One issue that was that was raised very early on um, by by the stakeholders was was the potential from from wind carriage from outbreaks in the north, and we're grateful to our colleagues in Severa for carrying out this this analysis, Guy McGrath, and um, what what he what he did he he, he um looked at what's known as a series of meteorological concentration dispersion models uh, from January the 15th until uh, February 29th and he looked basically he looked at the wind patterns on those days and the the, the source we we looked at was in southeast Tyrone because there was a there was a cluster in that area at the time and it was close closest to the to the to the large outbreak in North Monaghan uh, we found that there was no date within that period when when the weather weather conditions or the wind directions were considered appropriate or, or suitable for for windborne carriage from from that uh, from that kind of cluster to to the North Monon cluster. Um, we then looked at the enterprise types, and three of the the, the outbreaks were in turkeys. It is known that turkeys are more susceptible to avian influenza. Um, derived from waterfowl and they're they're thought to act as a source of infection for other birds to to make this to make matters worse the clinical science in turkeys may be may be vague or inapparent and as i alluded to earlier on the main clinical sign seen in this outbreak was was um egg drops a, a drop in egg production that clearly isn't an issue where in where the birds are being produced for meat so it was pretty difficult to, to detect it in turkeys. Furthermore, um, the the reproductive ratio, what the R, the R value, which you've probably become familiar with as as a result of of COVID, um, and you all know that the R value to bring the uh, and to to bring an epizootic or epidemic under control, the R value needs to be less than zero. The the R value in turkeys is estimated between five and a half and fifteen. Now. That's that's a wide range, and I think even if we if we considered it was five and a half, it's still considerably higher than that in chickens of 3.8. So um, this would suggest that that low path avian influenza is significantly more contagious in turkeys than in chickens. And as as I said earlier on, um, the lack of, of of significant clinical signs in in the turkeys um, wouldn't alert. Wouldn't alert the the um, the, the flock owner or, or staff. Um, the next issue we looked at was that 11 of the 14 outbreaks were in layer flocks, and the issue here is that layers generally, um, when when you have when you have layers, um, there's going to be much more movements of people and collection equipment between flocks as associated as associated compared to say meat producing flocks, and I think on average, um, the, the 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 eggs are are collected between two and three times per week. So that um, that increased level of movements increased the potential for for a biosecurity breakdown. So our conclusions. Um, 
given the proximity of the index case in West Monaghan to a confirmed case in County Fermanagh, and g given that it was all 99.88% genetically similar, and the chron chronology, it's likely that the first case in Monaghan was linked epidemiologically to the neighbouring case in Fermanagh. So, and then our other, our um, our other evidence, as I alluded to earlier on, was that there was a single entry of the virus into Ireland rather than than multiple uh, parallel incursions from wild birds. Then, in terms of the the North Monaghan cluster, where 11 of the 14 um, outbreaks took place, um, there was no obvious epidemiological link uh, between this any of these cases and the first case in West Monaghan or any of the Northern Ireland cases. Um, the outbreak, as I said, was in a turkey flock, and this may have been significant as turkeys would appear to be more susceptible to low path avian influenza, and there was always that there was always um, greater potential for onward transmission from turkeys than than from chickens, and because of the, the because of the insidious nature of this in in the turkeys, it's quite likely that a large infectious virus load was created uh, by by the outbreak in the area, and just to, to this this map here kind of gives an idea of the concentration of poultry enterprises in in County Monaghan, and um, as you can see, there's a heavy concentration of poultry inter, inter, enterprises there. Um, airborne transmission of infection over long distances is generally not considered to be a major major transmission route, and that that was. Um, we we found that from the um the, the um meteorological models that, that that were carried out and that's that's long distance though however dust can be blown for distances up to 1 kilometer and as you can see from that um from 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 the density map here um you could well have you could have well have flocks within a kilometer of each other and so this emphasised the need to douse carcasses with an appropriate disinfectant at depopulation as dust particles, if, if this wasn't done, if this dousing was not done, dust particles could be blown from one farm to another or indeed contaminate fomites. Um, the, other, the, the other issue that um, became apparent to us was that there was, there was um, prolonged, some prolonged intervals to reporting and depopulation and this this was a large due in a large part to the insidious nature of of the low path avian influenza. Um, it's it's quite possible that because of the mild clinical signs or indeed no clinical signs, I suppose, being before they were observed, that the disease was circulating in flocks for some time. And indeed, um, LPI was detected by serological testing in two flocks which had no history of clinical disease. Um, and these, these, this low mortality means this, the infected birds are a source of infection for longer. Um, all the all these findings would suggest that there was um, there were likely to be sizable viral loads in the in the environment of any affected flock um, from once they became infected until they were depopulated. Um, in addition, I, I think I think I've mentioned the turkeys. I might be overdoing the turkeys at this stage, but delays in prompt identification and depopulation of some infected flocks increase the risk of a viral buildup and onward spread to other flocks. Um, and then this neighbourhood effect, and like um, we don't want, we don't want to be um, we, we don't want to be um, dissuading people from being neighbourly and you know all the good practice neighbourly practice in the countryside of sharing machinery and assisting neighbours. But shared labour has been known to facilitate the, the spread of the virus between flocks, and um, I suppose this is this is no more than what we've seen with COVID that the need for for cocooning and of of susceptible people no more than. In in a situation where where there's outbreaks like this, there is the, the need for vigilance and unfortunately keeping keeping to themselves while wh while th th there's a, a large viral load in the area. The high density of intensive poultry enterprises in a condensed area um, resulted in a, a high concentration of susceptible birds in that area, and 
when if if that there were any secure biosecurity breaches um they could facilitate this indirect transmission through fomites um say contamination of machinery or or indeed clothes or clothes on on, on people's movements so um these there's there's as i said there's a there's a lot of um there's a lot of lines of inquiry being being, being were were followed here but it was it was difficult to attribute the spread to any one single issue so but it does highlight the need for robust biosecurity practice to be implemented comprehensively on on poultry farms um to first of all avoid the introduction in the first instance this bio exclusion and then biocontainment on any flock that is affected to prevent onwards transmission um, to other flocks. So that's um, that's all I have to say on, um, on 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 the outbreak June. But I think it would be remiss of me today um, not not to uh, pay tribute to um, to Mike McGann. Um, I first met uh, on the day his retirement from Animal Health Ireland was announced. Um, I first met Mike in 2005 in the Longford Arms Hotel um, with with Simon Moore when we were on the the road show for the Herd Health Initiative that evolved into um, Animal Health Ireland, and it was no surprise when Mike was appointed chairman in 2009. Um, I've seen him coax, cajole, and encourage various stakeholders, stakeholders, and, and including myself. And I think to paraphrase Othello and Charlie High, I think we can say he has done he has done the state some service, and well we know it. So thanks very much, Mike, for all you've done for for animal health in Ireland. Thanks, Damien, and a, a very fitting thanks for for Mike as well. 